Hello, everybody. This is Nina Olson, and I'm introducing today a tax chat that we did, the Center on Taxpayer Rights did, on the 9th of February about gender issues in taxation. And this is a two-part tax chat. The first part of the tax chat is a really interesting discussion between three wonderful folks who work in this area. Michelle Harding, who is the senior tax economist and head of tax data and statistical analysis at OECD's Center for Tax Policy and Administration in Paris, France. We have Eleanor Christofferson, who is professor of tax law at the School of Law, Psychology and Social Work at the Orebro University in Sweden and Amy Matsui, who is the Senior Counsel and Director of Income Security at the National Women's Law Center in Washington, D.C. And I think you will really enjoy that, that conversation between us um, and the viewers. It was a live event that we've recorded. Um, the second part of this discussion of gender and taxation is a a conversation between myself and Atia Weris, who is the acting deputy principal of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and also an associate professor of fiscal law and policy at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And so I think you will really enjoy these discussions. The topics are fascinating and very broad ranging and really go to the heart of what taxation is supposed to be about, what it serves, what it promotes, what is its purpose. Um, so enjoy. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is uh, another one of our tax chats for February, 2021. And the topic of our tax chat today is is the um, impact of gender of gender issues on taxation and taxation on gender issues. So we have some really wonderful guests today. We have Michelle Harding from OECD. We have Eleanor Christofferson from uh, Orebro University in Sweden, and we have Amy Matsui from the National Women's Law Center from Washington, DC. And we hope that um, Atia Weris will be joining us from the University of Nairobi um, uh, very shortly. I think she may be having some um, problems with the web. So we're gonna start off, uh, just so you know the way that this works, we've muted all of the guests, but we are going to be keeping it so that I can see what your comments are in chat and we will be raising them. Uh, I, will, I will work in any of them as they're going along um, so that we can, we can inter, inter, you know, insert them into our conversations. And at the end, we will have time so that we can talk as well. You all can raise questions, you know, unmute and talk as well. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with Michelle who um, wrote a blog a while ago that was really what we thought was really a framing piece on you know, thinking about gender and taxation and just the idea that, that uh, you know, something that might appear gender gender blind is not necessarily gender neutral. So, um, Michelle, do you want to sort of start? Yes, thank you very much, Nina. Uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be part of this text chat uh, this evening. Um, in my opening remarks, I wanted to, to frame my remarks around two questions uh, for discussion, which are also the foundational questions of the OECD framework for considering tax and gender issues. And these, uh, this framework was highlighted in the blog that, that Nina just referenced. So the two questions I'd like to pose uh, to, to frame our discussion today is the first is why should we consider the impact of tax on gender? And then the second question flows out of that, which is how should we consider the impact of tax on gender? 
And as Nina already said, by the impact of tax on gender, we don't mean to imply it's a one-way street. Um, it's not a one-directional relationship. Tax can certainly influence gender equality, but gender differences in society that have nothing to do with tax can in turn interact with the tax system. And there are two reasons why we should consider uh, the impact of tax on gender and gender on tax. Firstly, it's simply a matter of fundamental human rights. It, it's a matter of equity. Government policies of all kinds, including taxation, should promote gender equality. And, and this is recognized explicitly as a key goal in the sustainable development goals. From a tax perspective, of course, equity is also one of the foundational principles of tax policy that, that policymakers consider uh, in implementing tax reforms and tax policies. Uh, and gender equity is an important uh, dimension of uh, equity more broadly, including income and wealth equity, which are more traditionally considered. The second reason we, we should consider tax and gender is because there's an economic imperative to do so. Uh, a few years ago, the OECD estimated that the income loss associated with gender discrimination uh, in social institutions was in the order of approximately 12 trillion US dollars uh, at the time, uh, which is roughly 16% of world GDP. Uh, and that's a big enough gap in the best of times. And as you all are very well aware, we're not in the best of times. Uh, and in the COVID recovery, we really can't afford to be ignoring a gap of that magnitude. And we can't afford uh, having participants in the economy that are not fully uh, mobilized. Uh, to mobilize Ban Ki-moon's statement, uh, sorry, to paraphrase Ban Ki-moon's statement uh, on investment in gender, promoting gender equality and taxation is not only the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. The second question that I posed uh, at the outset was how should we consider the impact of tax on gender and gender on tax? And there's a, a well-known distinction in the literature between explicit biases and implicit biases in tax systems. Explicit biases are comparatively easy to see and to find. Explicit biases are where the tax system has explicit provisions which are different for men and for women. Uh, and historically, many of these explicit biases tended to reinforce inequalities uh, in, in gender. Uh, happily, they're becoming increasingly rare, uh, and many countries that have had them in the past have moved to, to eliminate those. Two examples without wanting to pick on these countries in particular, but in the Netherlands, historically, I think till in the 80s, there was a, a tax credit for married men, which was higher than the equivalent credit for married women. Uh, and in South Africa, until the mid 90s, uh, there were higher marginal personal income tax rates for married women and for single men than there were for married men. Uh, as I mentioned, these types of biases are becoming much less common. Uh, we're actually seeing explicit biases that often go the other way, which aim to explicitly reduce uh, gender bias in society. And uh, some examples of these include uh, some states in India which have introduced uh, property tax rates, which are lower for women than for men to try to encourage women's property ownership. Uh, and in Singapore, there are provisions to encourage women, particularly women with children, uh, to enter the labor force. But the second type of bias uh, that can uh, exist in tax systems uh, and which is probably more common and larger in magnitude is implicit bias in tax systems. And implicit bias is much harder to find than explicit bias. It occurs when the tax system doesn't have provisions which differ between men and women. It's ostensibly gender neutral or gender blind. But where the tax system interacts with gender differences that are already present in society. And there are a range of areas in which this can occur. One of the most well-known and one of the most well-researched uh, is in labor market participation. Uh, we know, for example, uh, that there are many, difference in how men, many differences in how men and women participate in labor markets. Uh, women have lower rates of participation in labor markets overall. Uh, they tend to work more in non-standard or part-time contracts. And the supply of women's labor is much more responsive to changes in wages than men's labor is. So even having the same tax rules for men and women in these settings can have different incentive effects for women relative to men. And I know we'll come back to labor taxation later in the discussions. I won't go further than that now. Uh, but also wanted to stress that labor markets are not the only area where the tax system can implicitly discriminate against women. Other taxes, including consumption taxes, corporate taxes, and property taxes in particular can also have gendered impacts because men and women have different socioeconomic realities. 
We know, for example, that there are differences in the ownership of capital between women and men. There are marked differences in consumption patterns and in expectations around unpaid work. And all of these can result in implicit gender biases coming through in the tax system. Women are also more highly represented in the informal market in almost all countries than men are, which we, we hope to come back to later. Um, and informal taxes and user fees, particularly in developing countries, can also have a very disproportionately heavy impact on women. To conclude, um, anywhere that there are socioeconomic differences between men and women in the formal economy or the informal economy or in unpaid work, uh, the tax system can therefore have a gender bias in practice, even if it does not have different provisions for men and women. And we also know that COVID-19 has amplified many of these underlying socioeconomic differences, which in turn is likely to exacerbate gender biases that are present in the tax system. With that, I will hand back to you, Nina. Okay, thank you so much. I, you know, I'm going to just do a little bit of channeling my inner Atia Weris um, to present some issues and then hopefully she'll be able to join us for the conversation. And if not, we'll figure out a way to tack on her comments um, at the end when we do the video and upload it. But, you know, Atia in 2016 and 17, wrote a policy brief for the Association for Women's Rights in Development, or AWID, which we will send out to the attendees and post on the YouTube site. And it really looked at the impact of illicit financial flows, or IFF, on gender issues, and really from a feminist perspective. And one thing in her later work, she's found how much illicit financial flows have actually been perpetrated by women themselves, which is an interesting study. Um, but she really identified several ways in which um, the, the drawing away of financial resources from countries, in particular the developing countries, really impact the ability of women and children in those countries to prosper. And she identified, of course, that you know, drawing away resources, public resources, means that you don't have the funds for public delivery of social services. It also means that there would be unemployment and underinvestment in the economy. So that, um, and since women are often the last to be hired in those countries, you know, or hired in lower paying jobs and you're not developing higher paying jobs, that has a real impact on women. Um, as well, what you end up doing as you have less income coming from income taxes to fund public goods is you start looking at, as Michelle was talking about, property taxes or consumption taxes. And since women are often in, you know, in, in the lower end of the economy, then you know, those consumption taxes are very regressive and they're ending up paying taxes on things that are their basic goods. Um, and their survival goods. And then of course you have the whole issue of what are you taxing under consumption taxes? And I think Eleanor will talk a little bit about this a little later, but are you taxing, for example, feminine hygiene products, you know, under a consumption tax, you know, or, you know, some form of a VAT, a value added tax. Then for the developing countries, you have some of the challenges is because they are not able to have the, you know, capture the revenue, um, to form their tax base, um, they become more and more dependent on, you know, loans um, and development funding, which always comes with very um, specific requirements, which may make sense from the lender's point of view, but may really limit the independence of the countries. Um, and so the other, then finally, you also have the aspects of, um, illicit financial flows um, actually really foster in areas where there is conflict. And conflict, you know, continuing wars and civil strife definitely harms, um, harms women. You know, they are the victims often and children of that strife ongoing. And so you just see in terms of women that, that the way that the tax system is structured globally may have has great impact on folks 
um, as they're trying to go about and structure their lives. Um, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll stop at that point and turn to Amy to sort of talk, we'll come back to several of the issues that I've touched on in our conversation, but I'll turn it over to Amy to talk about the United States and also her own organization for a bit. Thank you so much, Nina, and just echoing um, how great a pleasure it is to be on this panel, especially with all of you here today to be talking about gender and the tax code. Um, so as Nina mentioned, I'm Director of Income Security at the National Women's Law Center, which is a women's public policy and um, advocacy organization based in Washington, DC. And we have taken kind of the position that um, equitable tax policy is central to gender and racial um, justice because tax policy does shape every facet of women's lives in a number of ways. So to begin with, uh, the tax system raises the revenues for our shared priorities to invest in education, infrastructure, housing, um, income supports, um, health care, and more. It also sets the rules that help shape our economy. And then to a certain extent, it also creates incentives or disincentives for particular types of economic behaviors by individuals and families. And so um, as Michelle observed, you know, there, there are very few provisions of the federal tax code in the United States that explicitly distinguish between men and women or by race, but the tax code is a human, is a document that's written by people who are in their particular culture and time. And so um, we've had, you know, the kind of the pleasure of sharing the observations of academics, some of whom are on the call today, who looked at critical tax theory and kind of teased out the values, the assumptions that are built into the tax code because of the people who have written it. And that includes who is in the paid labor force and what does that participation look like over time? How is paid and unpaid labor distributed within the family and within society? Um, and assumptions about um, what is the proper balance between work that is paid and unpaid and the gender and racial characteristics of the people who provide that unpaid labor. So um, with kind of that backdrop in mind, I wanted to kind of talk about a couple of provisions, some of which are featuring quite prominently in the conversations around COVID relief that the United States Congress and administration are looking at right now. Um, just kind of one example though of where gender is embedded in a way in the tax code is to look at the joint marital filing structure. So as you know, the, the tax unit for married couples in the United States primarily, and the most beneficial one is joint filing. And so many people have observed that because the income of both spouses is combined and the tax right is applied there, second earners are often subject to a higher rate of tax on their frequently lower earnings. And I wanted to just unpack that a little bit. So in opposite sex couples, because of factors in the United States labor market, because of kind of societal um, expectations about caregiving that are very deeply gendered, women face not only, as Michelle mentioned, um, frequently fewer hours and more kind of less attachment to full-time work, they also experience gender wage gaps and they face the burden in many instances of caregiving. We're seeing this play out very prominently during COVID when women are trying to work at home. And I will note that this is for women who can afford to work from home and not women who have to be in the labor force as essential workers and have to go into grocery stores and schools and childcare facilities and healthcare facilities. But we're seeing play out that while, you know, higher income, higher paid white collar women are working at home, they're simultaneously caregiving for small children. They're helping with schooling. They're expected to kind of keep the trains running in families. And it's becoming increasingly apparent how difficult it is to sustain paid work and family and caregiving responsibilities. And women are dropping out of the workforce in record numbers and also losing their minds in the process. So one of the things I think that is 
that this is reflected, that reflects upon the joint marital filing structure is, yes, if women are facing a higher tax rate on their lower earnings, that presents an economic disincentive. But I think that this disincentive has to be viewed in the context of all of the systemic factors which make it hard for women to stay in the workforce. Not having affordable, accessible, high quality childcare is also a disincentive to going into the paid workforce. Not having a robust paid family and medical leave policy that applies to all workers also is a disincentive to entering the workforce. And having a lack of flexibility or an expectation from employers that caregiving and work responsibilities are things that every employee balances in their daily lives is, again, a disincentive to entering the workforce. So I think that you know, the, the tax system here reflects existing gender bias in all of our systems and structures, and it also reinforces it because it's one of many economic disincentives. And it's also part of a narrative that it is economically rational for an individual family to decide that the woman as a caregiver, as someone who has a lower usually um, income, that it makes economic sense for her not to participate in paid labor. Simultaneously, we're not looking at the other side of the equation where women who don't participate in the labor force because they're caregiving, um, they are going to be losing retirement savings benefits and social security benefits because those are earned through paid work. It may make it harder for women to go back into the labor force because not having that continue, having that disruption means that they will not have kind of the same level of work. They won't have work history. They won't have salary history. They're gonna come in um, at a lower salary, lower position, less chance for advancement than they otherwise might have been able to. And I will also point out that, you know, it may contribute to kind of power and economic imbalances within the family unit. If someone is not contributing income there is a societal kind of view that they don't have the same amount of economic power and that is not really good for anybody. So I think that um, the tax system, this is an example of where the tax system, as Michelle was pointing out, reflects kind of an overall system and structure. And it also points to the places where the tax code does not raise the revenues that we need to invest in the systems and supports Child care is a public good, health care that doesn't eat up a family's budget, that helps support everyone's participation in the economy in ways that support women, families, communities of color across the board. Um, so with that, as one example of kind of how tax and gender impact um, play out in the United States system, I will um, turn it back over to Nina and look forward to the rest of this discussion. You know, it's really interesting about, you know, as, as, a tax, as a former tax administrator and someone who spent her life thinking about tax administration versus policy, you know, you have a policy, how do you implement it? Um, listening to you, it reminded me of a provision we identified early in my tenure as National Taxpayer Advocate, where the requirement was that if you were a husband and wife co-owned business and you were unincorporated, you had to file a partnership return rather than just filing, like taking the income and the expenses, splitting them in half and treating each of you as a sole proprietorship. And people didn't want to file, you know, they didn't want to pay for a partnership return to be filed. It's very complicated partnership law. And so what they would end up doing is just filing the self-employment form with the husband being the sole earner. And of course, if they were filing married filing jointly, it didn't matter in terms of tax or income tax because you still had the same filing status and the same deductions and everything. But where it really showed up was getting credit for the hours worked as a worker and getting social security benefits attributed to you so that when you retired, those credits would be on your account. And so often you would see people who had worked all their life in a husband and wife owned business, you know, once the, the husband dies before the wife does, and 
she only gets survivor benefits, which is less than if she had earned the benefit, attributed the benefits to herself. And that's leaving aside, you know, separations, divorce, you know, et cetera. And it was, it actually took us a while, but we actually got that changed in the law so that if it was a husband and wife or spousal co-owned business, you could file, you would, the default, you filed your separate schedules and you could allocate the income where, the way you wanted. Now, of course, that's that's got its own issues in terms of balance of power within the marital unit, but at least it allowed people to, you know, um, report it without putting a burden that was driving them to, you know, rather than filing a partnership return, they were just putting it on one Schedule C. And that was just, that was hidden in the code. You know, nobody really thought about it until actually we had a case where somebody's spouse had died before and we were trying to shuffle, you know, prove to the Social Security Administration that she had worked in this entity all along and should be getting greater benefits and being given credit for the work that she did. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Now, you know, what you mentioned the point about joint and several liability and in the United States, the downside or joint joint filings, married filing, joint filing, you know, one of the the, the aspects of the, the United States tax system is that we really tax the family unit and that brings in all sorts of complication. And for women in particular, it the have married filing joint brings in joint and several liability for the other per, the other spouses um, debts, and you may not know that income has not been reported accurately when you file that joint return, and that has created complexity in the United States Code to go ahead and create what we call innocent spouse relief to free yourself of joint and several liability. Now, Eleanor, you were, you know, you were saying the other day about Sweden partially repealing joint filing and then and then getting rid of it entirely. So maybe you could talk about the Swedish tax structure and some of the impact on gender in that aspect. Yeah, thank you very much, Nina. And uh, I'm really glad to be here and listening to this and participating in this uh, interesting conversation. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Elna Kristoffsson, professor at Örebro University in Sweden. Uh, my speciality from substantive law would be value added tax law. Uh, but um, the last uh, few years, or the last maybe five years or something, uh, I have, or maybe 10 years even, uh, I have expanded my uh, research um, in the direction of uh, uh, tax procedure, taxpayer rights, and uh, I have also uh, been working the last one and a half year together with the, the universities of uh, Belgrade, Cadiz, Saarland and Lumsta uh, on a um, master on law and gender, uh, an international master and uh, where we have uh, made, uh, developed a lot of the uh, syllabi the last year and now we're writing a textbook on law and gender and so, so I've been quite busy with uh, law and gender uh, the last like one and a half uh, year. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, tell you about the abolishment of joint filing in Sweden, and that is something that was considered as a milestone in uh, achieving or increasing the equality between uh, men and women. And uh, it, it is uh, it's seen as a historical event nowadays, I would say. Uh, since um, the compulsory joint filing was abolished already in 1965 and in uh, 1971 the joint filing uh, on income tax was uh, abolished completely. Um, and uh, the joint filing system in Sweden, it uh, looks like that, that uh, the basic deduction that was double if you were married. Uh, but when you were calculating the progressive tax, the spouses were a unit, and uh, uh, that led to that the income of the second earner, which was uh, who were uh, normally the wife, was put on top, and uh, therefore uh, it uh, well she didn't have a, an incentive to uh, to go to work just as um, 
Amy mentioned also with the childcare costs and so that uh, were added. So very little was uh, left of her income if she wanted to uh, start working. Uh, high income earners, uh, they actually paid more tax in this uh, system than if they would have been uh, single persons. So we had like a marriage penalty for high income earners. Um, the uh, abolishment of the joint filing in Sweden, uh, that was uh, actually not a very big deal. It was no great opposition uh, to abolish the joint filing. And that was a little bit strange actually because the social uh, Democrats who were um, they were in the majority then they had a very long governance in Sweden and unbroken governments between 1936 and 1976. Mm -hmm. uh, but many of the social uh, Democrats, they were workers. And for them, since they had this uh, double basic deduction, the joint filing was actually positive. And one, one could also have expected that uh, the conservative a party that consisted of a lot of conservative men, that they would uh, like want to keep the uh, traditions uh, and so, but the conservative party wasn't uh, against the abolishment of the joint filing either. Some of them uh, were, but, but as a party, they were not against it. So um, it was um, not a very, very, a big deal to uh, abolish it and um, uh, maybe it was not uh, perceived as so strange where with the tax return where women uh, were more independent since uh, if, during the 1960s more women uh, it, well we saw more women at uh, uh, work and there was also a spirit of female uh, liberation in Sweden. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, and it was actually also very successful for the equality, or if you, uh, if you um, uh, define equality between uh, men and women uh, in a way that you uh, find the, that the women should be economically independent and that they should uh, uh, work and so, um, then it was uh, successful because um, the abolishment of joint filing actually uh, increased uh, women in work a lot, or the number of them a lot. Uh, and that, together with um, a quite um, a cheap child uh, care in uh, Sweden, we don't pay much. There is a maximum amount that you pay every month for uh, child care and it doesn't matter if the child care is uh, like from a, a private kindergarten or if it is a, a public one it's still a, a, a limit on how high the fee uh, can be and it's around uh, what could it be like 150 dollar maybe um, us dollar a month uh, so it's quite uh, quite low uh, and uh, we also have a parental insurance, uh, which means that you can stay uh, one year at home with your child and have 80% uh, of your salary. And uh, some time, I don't this, it, this might have changed. I'm not sure how much it is, that is, uh, but I think it's a month or something, or some other Swede can correct me if, it, if I'm wrong, uh, but to, which is reserved for the father. Um, and uh, already back in 1939, it was uh, uh, prohibited to uh, fire pregnant women from, from work. So we have a long uh, tradition with that uh, as well. Uh, but the abolishment of the joint filing is considered to have been very important for uh, the equality in Sweden. So that was one issue that I uh, wanted to uh, raise. I have plans uh, to uh, talk about, say something about the informal economy, if we come back to that. Uh, and um, 
I would also like to say some words on the so-called tampon uh, tax. Uh, in um, uh, Europe and in also in many uh, other countries, uh, it has uh, become uh, popular to uh, apply a reduced value added tax or a goods and services tax on feminine, feminine hygiene products. Uh, as sanitary towels and uh, tampons. And uh, what I, uh, from my value added tax background, uh, I've been uh, considering this uh, a bit if it is a good thing or not. Because uh, it definitely demonstrates a, a political intention to promote or at least not discriminate uh, women. But if you look how on upon how uh, lower how low reduced the consumption tax rates work, then you can see at least at least it's a, the Swedish experience that um, they don't have or they seldom seldom have a long term effect on the price since the price is uh, still mainly set by supply and demand, and uh, therefore the winner. Uh, of a tampon tax or the presumed winner uh, is the supplier of the sanitary pads and the uh, tampons and um, so and I mean that can result in that the supplier employs more people that they increase the quality of the pro product supplied or that it actually just generates more uh, profit but uh, my, uh, what I think about this is that maybe it is important anyway, because it is uh, because of the signal value of the political signal value of reducing uh, the tax rate in Sweden. We do not have a reduced uh, rate on um, these uh, products and um, there is uh, no real discussion about introducing that either. Uh, we are um, uh, looking at the new tax reform in, uh, in Sweden, uh, but uh, the, uh, it, the discussion about the VAT rates is uh, rather to have only one uh, VAT rate, uh, as in Denmark, uh, than introducing more uh, and applying more uh, reduced rates. Yeah, I think um, I will um, uh, leave the word to Nina again. Thank you. That's fascinating. I really appreciated that that analysis, Eleanor, in the history of abolishment of joint and several liability in Sweden. Um, I think, again, I'll channel my inner IT as we go to a conversation of the informal economy and also some of the issues coming out of COVID. One of the things that... Um, IT was Atia was going to talk about was um, the impact of digitalization on the informal economy, and there's certainly some gender impact there. What she was seeing was um, that that there were basically historically the informal economy was really a cash economy, and it was it was working with the lower income levels of the pub, you know the population, but as um, digitalization has allowed people to have home-based businesses and sell across borders and all those sorts of things. You have the middle class moving in. And um, although you, and one of the things that I, I, Atia said in Africa was that they were seeing was that um, as people, as a result of COVID were being let go of formal jobs, um, being workers in regular informal businesses, um, they were actually starting businesses more informally, but it was done through digital businesses, you know, home-based businesses, which actually leaves a record, you know, leaves some kind of tracking so that 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 in there you're really getting a divide in the informal economy in a way. And COVID is um, is uh, exacerbating that. She also noted that um, that in Africa, 5.10% of the businesses pay VAT and 80% um, 
you know, are informal and pay no vet, they're not even registered. So there's nobody really on the system. And what COVID did was shut down any of the kinds of visits that, that tax authorities might make to locations of the informal economy, more the cash-based economy, which would then maybe bring people into the system. Um, and so, you know, you're seeing kind of the, the, the people on the lower, what she also noted about the COVID economy was that people on the low end of the formal economy who might be the first to be let go and who also might be women, tend to be women in those entry level jobs are moving now into the informal and it may, you know, they'll, it'll be a while before those jobs come back in the formal economy, if ever. And so you're really seeing a bubble in the informal economy in that way. So I, I throw that out to Michelle or Eleanor. I know both of you wanted to talk about the informal economy. Those were some of the observations that Atia had made on an earlier call we had. Michelle, would you like to start? Sure. Thank, thanks, Nina. Um, and it, uh, it's interesting to hear from Atia and from you on, on the impact of, of COVID on women's employment in the informal economy, because We've also seen uh, a sharp impact on the formal econ economy, perhaps as the counterpart to the impact on the informal economy, but including in OECD countries and the US and EU countries, um, we saw a very sharp fall of formal employment in the first quarter of 2020. I think in Europe, it was roughly three times as big for women as it was for men. Uh, and while much of that has redressed since the crisis, um, it, it's still, I don't think, back to where it was. And that's one way COVID differs quite substantially from uh, the global financial crisis where the opposite was true, where we saw a much greater impact on men's employment than on women's employment. And in that crisis, it was partially, women were partially protected by the fact that they were more typically part-time. Uh, so the hours fell, but their employment did not, not to nearly the same degree. Uh, and this time, uh, the, the crisis is more directly affecting sectors where women are, are prevalent. So the healthcare sector, the, the tourism, the hospitality sectors where women tend to be more predominant uh, and where informality is in some ways easier to, to maintain than, than in other sectors. Um, from a tax point of view, it's difficult to, to ignore informality, but it's also difficult to, to find it and to measure what the impacts are. Uh, and in economies where the share of informality is so great, um, it gets harder still. The AT is often thought to be a tax which indirectly captures the informal economy, because even if people are not paying VAT, uh, they are also not able to claim input credits for the VAT paid on, on the goods that they purchase. But that, I think, does not hold when you start to get up to economies where 80 or 90% of, of people are not paying VAT. I haven't thought about it at that level of, of magnitude, but it would bear more, more thought. Um, another aspect of the informal economy or, or related aspect is the presence of user fees uh, and informal taxes. And these tend to be much more predominant in developing countries than, than in OECD countries. So, so what they are, user fees are, are fees where you pay for the service that is provided, uh, e.g. fees for, for healthcare, or for education, for water, or for sanitation. Um, and they're not strictly taxes um, because they are paid per use. They're not uh, unrequited payments that you must make to the government. But they are the price paid by citizens for accessing services that are provided more or less um, on a monopoly basis by the government. And so you can't ignore them in terms of the impact of taxes or, or taxes and user fees on gender. Uh, and in Africa, the, the International Center for Tax Development has done several good studies on the impact of these user fees on women. Uh, and there was a study in 2019 from, from the ICTD um, looking at city markets in, in Tanzania uh, and found that uh, there were toilet fees uh, that you had to pay for access to the toilets at these markets and they were levied by, by the, the local governments. Women ended up paying significantly more, nearly 20% of their income in these user fees because they needed to use the toilets more often and they had fewer options uh, to, to avoid using the toilet, shall we say. 
Um, the, the other related aspect which applies in the informal economy uh, and the formal economy alike in many developing countries is the presence of informal taxes. Uh, and these are taxes which don't really fall within the explicit tax laws. Um, they can be imposed by the state under informal arrangements or by non-state actors who are providing some of these local services. Uh, and the, the research also done by ICD um, over a longer time period shows that these also fall disproportionately heavy, heavily on women, in part because they tend to apply fairly regressively, um, because they apply to people operating in sectors that tend to be more informal. And so in the discussion of tax and informality, I think it's also important to, to consider, firstly, the perhaps indirect impact of formal taxation, but to look beyond that and to look at the impact of user fees and, and informal taxes as well. Eleanor, did you want to speak to this issue? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but if you because if you talk about uh, the informal uh, economy and uh, say uh, home workers as uh, one uh, important uh, group there, I mean we have uh, uh, market and street vendors, we have uh, home work workers, but then uh, as you mentioned as well, you know we have the uh, upcoming like the sharing economy and uh, uh, and so as well, and. Uh, uh, there is this uh, issue that uh, the home work workers, for example, are outside the tax system to a great extent. And I think that we see that uh, all over uh, the world, that they are not uh, included in the tax system and they are often uh, women. Uh, and since they are not included in the tax system, they don't get any pensions, they don't get any like uh, social benefits like uh, uh, maternity benefits and, and so on, which are uh, based on the tax uh, payment. And uh, I wanted to uh, share an experience that we have done in my country uh, to uh, actually get the home workers in from the informal e economy to the formal economy. Uh, and I mean that's uh, that's uh, not so easy because it's uh, normally uh, it's just to I mean just to pay them without paying taxes is uh, cheaper and uh, they can also get more money if they don't have to pay their uh, the taxes. But uh, what Sweden has done is to introduce a tax. Uh, credit uh, for like cleaning services, babysitting, uh, ironing, gardening, and so on. And this tax credit, it works like this, that if you hire somebody uh, who is registered for uh, taxes, uh, then you can actually get a tax credit uh, on the invoice. And it works like that, that the tax agency pays directly to the supplier. So the tax credit that I get if I would uh, buy such a, uh, such a service, if I would uh, buy some cleaning services, for example, the tax credit that I uh, get uh, is uh, deducted from the price and it is paid out to the supplier. And this gives me as a buyer an incentive to buy from somebody who pays the taxes. And also the one who pays the taxes get part of uh, the service paid directly from the tax agency. So I just wanted to share that one because that has actually also helped to uh, get some of the, or quite, uh, quite a lot of the informal economy into the formal uh, economy. And uh, I understand, I mean, if in countries where you have a lot of, of uh, informal economy and maybe it's not so easy to, to um, yeah, I mean, it's not, you can just not copy uh, a concept to just copy role and it, it works uh, everywhere or elsewhere. But, um, but I think it's quite a, a clever uh, solution since it, um, it, it just doesn't, yeah, everybody gains on it, the buyer and uh, the uh, supplier and uh, yeah, everybody. 
maybe not the tax agency has to pay out uh, money. So I wanted to share that. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That's really fascinating. So Amy, I mean, we're talking about gender impact, you know, gender issues for taxation. And I think, you know, one of the issues is, can you even track what the impact is if, you know, on tax data, you're not even, you know, disaggregating it by gender, much less race or other kinds or ethnicity. So where are we in the United States on that? And what have you all been able to do, if anything? Thank you for raising that, Nina. That was one of the things that occurred to me that we kind of hadn't laid the groundwork for that conversation in the same way that Eleanor and Michelle could talk about what the impacts of particular tax policies are by gender. As you mentioned, in the United States, the, the Internal Revenue Service does not track tax expenditures by how they're received, either by gender or race or any other demographics. And in a way, for, for women who have, you know, tended to be kind of the second earner spouse, their um, kind of tax um, benefits are cloaked in a way by the, um, the joint filer status. So one of the things which has been really exciting is that there is a long body of scholarship in the United States of tax scholars who have pointed out that you can't determine what the impact of tax policy is, whether on women or communities of color or um, anything besides income, if we don't have the tax data to um, indicate whether the impact is positive or negative or neutral. And so, you know, scholars like Dorothy Brown, more recently, Professor Jeremy Bearer Friend, who's at George Washington University, have pointed out how important it is to get the data because otherwise people make assumptions about whether or not certain tax benefits are going to be beneficial for women or people of color. A very imperfect solution that we have um, and other public policy organizations have used is to look at kind of how, what the representation is, for example, for families uh, who are Black or Hispanic or Asian families in certain income levels or on the gender piece, looking at women who are supporting families on their own, so unmarried women, and where they fall in kind of the economic spectrum. One really exciting development has been that one of the executive orders issued by the Biden administration in the first um, month of taking office has been an executive order trying to promote an advanced racial equity. And one component of this executive order has been to establish an equitable data working group across different federal agencies. So this is really exciting. So first, the definition of the data that they're seeking across the government is very broad. It looks not only at race and gender, but also you know, veteran status. Um, they want to look at um, a whole kind of range of um, demographic data. And different agencies have been tasked with looking at, at federal data sets to see where is equitable data not available? Are there any barriers to increasing the kind of data which is available? And to, to make recommendations and take steps to make this data um, available across, across the government. One of the members of this working group is from the Department of Treasury and so um, you know, we're very excited to see kind of what data is going to become available and which so that that can inform tax and other economic policies to determine what the impact is. And ideally, you know, I think what would happen is that before a policy is enacted to do some forecasting to see whether, um, you know, what the, for the projected impacts could be by race and gender. Um, so that we can, you know, make the tax code, among other legal systems, advance equity rather than kind of reinforce inequitable patterns, income and wealth gaps, um, and other 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 measures of inequity. You know, I being inside the IRS, the IRS has the social security numbers of the taxpayers who are filing, and you can match that back to social security data. Um, in order to determine gender, at least gender at birth. And you can look at 
would the had the IRS done that kind of research, they could look at, for example, take up and participation of different provisions, which really goes to one of the the things that that is kind of unique or not, you know, sort of unique about the United States system as opposed to say Sweden or other systems is what we drive through the internal revenue code, you know, that, that rather than giving benefits to people directly, we give them through the internal revenue code. So the child care tax credit, you know, you get it because you're filing as opposed to, um, uh, getting a subsidy to pay childcare directly, whether you have, whether you need to file an income tax return or not. And, and I think, you know, not being able to have racial data to see what's going on with the take up of these benefits is very important. You don't know whether these policies are achieving the goals that they were established for. On the other hand, as I've tried to struggle with this and talk to the tax writers about this, it's like, there's so much antagonism in the United States about paying taxes that if you had a block on the inter, you know the annual return that said tell us not so much what your gender is but your but your race and your you know your sexual orientation and a few other things people would not fill it out they'd be furious so you're sort of stuck kind of trying to make things up matching census data with tax and it just it's very hard so I'll be very interested to see what what this working group proposes. And I think that goes again to a cultural issue, which is in some countries, it may be perfectly the norm to provide that information or the government already knows all of that anyway, and you can match it in that way. Um, it's not clear that you could match it with the United States, but maybe you can. Really interesting. We do have a couple of questions here that I want to um, read. So, someone found the discussion about the, the tax credit on specific activities in Sweden. It's a very interesting solution to formalize the workforce. However, I wonder if this measure puts former informal women into a trap because these formal jobs are usually associated with lower wages. Eleanor, you want to Take that. Yeah, yeah, that is the criticism uh, against it. And uh, when it was uh, introduced, that was definitely an argument uh, against introducing uh, uh, this uh, uh, tax credit. So uh, yeah, so uh, that is the other side of it, of it, so to uh, speak, because um, uh, we also have that um, uh, culture in Sweden that it is the uh, considered a little bit uh, well not so uh, not not so nice to have people working for you You should clean your house yourself uh, and you shouldn't hire somebody to clean your house and that it's uh, and and I mean it is of course a, a low status uh, job to to go uh, and to work with cleaning other people's houses and so on and it is definitely uh, connected with the low uh, wages uh, and so, so uh, that is uh, uh, definitely something that uh, would speak for not having uh, such a tax credit because it's got, it conservates uh, like uh, uh, old fashioned uh, uh, behavior and that you use people to come and clean your uh, your home and so so definitely I agree. So um, we did have a question from Al, a comment from Alice Abreu, and I'm going to actually mute her. We normally start with the questions now anyway from the audience. So Alice, why don't you ask your, your question if you can unmute yourself. No, well, I, I just wanted to, um, to tell folks that the, um, the, the conversation at the beginning of the chat about um, uh, overtly gendered tax provisions um, really touches a chord for me because I think uh, one of the starkest examples of that was a provision in the US Inter Internal Revenue Code that was very gendered um, and provided a caregiving deduction um, only for women of any marital status or men who were either married or divorced, but not for single men because who had never been married, because who would think that a single man would provide caregiving? Um, and 
the story of that provision and it's um, being found unconstitutional, one of the few provisions in the Internal Revenue Code that has ever been found by an appellate court to be unconstitutional, is told in a movie, which I highly recommend. Um, the movie is on, uh, on the basis of sex, and it tells the story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her taking on that case and litigating it and how that case really led to her being on the United States Supreme Court, which is a pretty cool story about a tax case. Um, and um, so if you haven't seen the movie, it's, it's on Amazon. Um, and I, it's a, it, it's a feel good movie. Um, there, there was when the child, the um, child and dependent care credit was introduced into the code. There is a fascinating exchange in the congressional record where a gentleman, one of the gentlemen, I, I think it was from the Senate, may have been from the House. I, there's an article that I can share with people. Um, uh, commented that you know we needed to. We needed to have the credit for, you know, people, women on welfare to go to work so someone could take care of their children. But we don't want the credit for a woman whose husband is earning a perfectly good job. And what she wants to work for is to be able to obtain a fur coat. And we don't want to give child care to a woman who's just trying to buy herself working in order to buy herself a fur coat. And that is part of the congressional record. So um, it's an interesting thing to see. Um, Natalie, you had something to, to ask about the data. And I will unmute you there. Thank you, Nina. Well, actually, I'm now uh, very much involved in the SDGs. And uh, basically, uh, I, I am very optimistic of that the framework of the SDGs can help us uh, accumulate data to be able to have a better understanding of the, the lay of the land. <laughs> so basically, my question is, now that we have a new president in the US, would it be possible to consider that the, the American government partner with uh, the GAFAM, so Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google, Facebook, they, those companies, like they're privately held basically, and they, they have tons of data that could be helpful into maybe at least studying faster the, the lay of the land. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that they are under consideration for more <laughs> regulation, so it would be interesting to see. Um, there are certainly lots of surveys where, and you know, I've actually conducted surveys where you're trying to see what people think that they participated in, you know, what ben tax benefits they got, but their memory of what they actually got and what they, what they, they, the benefits that they participated in and what they actually got is very different. It's always shocking to see what people, you know, thought that they got and what they actually got. Um, we haven't really talked specifically about the impact of COVID, you know, and also what countries are going to have to do going forward as they dig themselves out of a COVID economy. You know, um, Michelle, do you want to take that one on? Yes, um, well, I have, it's a big question to take on, but I'm happy to provide some remarks in response to the question for sure. So we discussed already um, about some of the impacts we've seen um, in terms of COVID and women's employment, both in the formal and informal sector, um, also in terms of childcare responsibilities for women. Um, and I think it's fair to say that many of these underlying socioeconomic realities that I started with have been worsened by, by COVID. And it's therefore probable that the tax system has, has a more uh, a stronger uh, bias in terms of uh, woman. But I think looking forward, there's going to be two imperatives for the tax system uh, recovering from the COVID crisis. The first is the tax policymakers are going to be look, looking to, to see how they can encourage economic recovery after the crisis. Uh, and the impact of the tax system there, and particularly the incentives it provides for women to participate in, in the labor market will be critical. 
But on the other hand, there's going to be a strong revenue hit from COVID-19 in almost every country. And we, we don't have comprehensive data on that yet at the OECD. My, my, you know, we'll be collecting it from uh, the middle of this year on. But we do know that all the initial indications suggest that it's going to exceed the impact of the global financial crisis on government's fiscal positions. And in the long term, uh, it will depend somehow on the recovery, but it will also, I think, necessitate governments to think about how do they redress this, this revenue imbalance? How do they fund the goods and services that they need to fund? Uh, and uh, this is not something the OSD thinks. This is, this is a longer term consideration. The recovery needs to come first, uh, but there are different directions that this can take. And we saw in the global financial crisis, that many of the austerity measures that were introduced, uh, particularly in Europe, had very negative impacts on, on gender equality, uh, particularly in terms of, of employment uh, participation, and then with all the flow-on effects that Amy detailed in, in her first intervention. And so it will be critically important for, for governments around the world to think when they are considering the fiscal needs after the crisis, not to impede the recovery and not to worsen gender outcomes uh, when they look at the sustainability of their, of, their finance, uh, sorry, of their fiscal systems in the longer term. So Philip Baker has a question then Marjorie. So Philip, I'm gonna unmute you. Thanks Nina and thanks very much everybody for the um, discussion, which I found very interesting indeed. Um, I, I wanted particularly to um, try to tease out a bit more information from Michelle about the statistic that she mentioned quite early on um, of, I think it was $12 trillion lost per annum through broadly gender biases, but I think I might not have uh, picked it up exactly. Can, can you explain a bit more about that? I was intrigued by that partly because well, what a contrast with the estimated economic impact of all this work on pillar one and pillar two. Uh, I mean, I, if you could monetize that, 12 trillion and assuming something like a 20% tax rate, you're going to have an impact of 20 times the impact of all of this work being done on taxation of the digitalized economy. Um, but am I missing something in understanding the, 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 the data, Michelle? So this, this data is based on a study that was carried out by my colleagues in the OECD Development Center. So I, I can't speak to the details of what they've done. I can send you, however, the paper on which it, which it was based. Um, but basically what they did was look at um, the SIGI index, which is an index that the OECD Development Center provides on discrimination in social institutions um, on a gender basis, uh, and looked at how that affected income per capita around the world, and then measured the gap uh, between countries with high SIGI index, meaning a high level of equality, uh, and countries with a low one in terms of income per capita, and used that to estimate the $12 trillion figure. In terms of the impact, I mean, the, the impact is, yeah, it, it's frankly enormous. If it's possible to monetize it, as you say, I think the key thing there is if, and also what role tax can play uh, in doing that. It's, it's undoubtedly part of the solution, but, but it's not the whole solution in its own right. Um, but I can follow up uh, with you directly afterwards to share the paper with you so you can see in more detail exactly how the estimation was made. And that'd be great. And if you want to share that with, with me, we can put that in the links as well. And Eleanor is going to check to see if there's a study in English about the tax credit that she was speaking about. We can get that out to people. So Marjorie, I'm going to unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? I think we've lost. Can Marjorie. you hear me? There you are. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm having some trouble with my wireless connection here. Sorry. Um, I want to thank you for organizing this tremendous uh, workshop. Uh, I want to raise an issue that's one of those, what I believe, hidden uh, biases, which is capital gains preferences that uh, are very standard in the US, although they've gone away a little bit. When I looked at this 10 years ago, uh, as part of a, a wonderful um, workshop and anthology that some of you may not uh, know about because it's so old already. It was a book called Challenging uh, Gender Inequality in Tax Policy, Making Comparative Perspectives. It was edited by Kim Brooks, Aza Gunnarsson, Lisa Phillips, 
and Maria um, Wersig. Anyway, I wrote about capital gains, and back then I believed that they were favor, the favoring of them was most helpful for men for two reasons. One, more men were wealthy than women, and so they had more money to play with, and men were, uh, women were more uh, risk averse th than men. And so the benefits were going primarily to men. And I, I posited that, in fact, some of the uh, preferences might be encouraging a lot of the volatility that was happening because uh, it encouraged, yes, we want to encourage entrepreneurship, but it also goes for just investing in you know, GameStop or whatever, just because people are playing it like a game. And that women with less income and um, less wealth and less income and maybe more risk averse and having to take care of children might, if they had extra money, buy an annuity instead of buying a stock fund. And yet that was taxed at ordinary rates and the uh, stock was being taxed at capital gains rate. So I think there are lots of, and I assume these statistics would still hold about risk averseness and but maybe not in, in wealth uh, accumulation. But I think there are lots of areas that we don't think about even the second or the third time. But when you keep going back, you say, gee, we have all kinds of implicit, not just economic biases, but social and cultural biases in there too. Right. Marjorie, I just want to throw in there as well that I think you know one of the responses to COVID as, as Michelle noted is going to be kind of raising revenues. And one of the things that in the, in the United States is drawing a lot of attention at least is kind of what we're calling the K-shaped recovery where very high income folks and billionaires are doing just fine yeah. and gaining wealth. Whereas, you know, people who are earning a living, essential workers are, are, are floundering. And so I think that we have, you know, right now in the relief portion of the conversation, there are definitely tax incentives some of which are targeted to businesses and others that are targeted towards, you know, kind of lower income people amongst whom, you know, families of color and women are overrepresented as people who have higher unemployment rates, who are essential workers, who have really lost out in this, um, in, in this recession. Um, but there is, I think, in the second kind of wave of legislation that's going to come after this initial relief package, I think there's going to be a really robust discussion about wealth taxes, reforming capital gains, um, whether there are inheritance or estate tax changes that need to be made to both harness, I think, some of the revenues that we need to rebuild the economy, but also to, to, to address wealth inequality and kind of the way that the, that, that is playing out in, re, in the recession is making that a much more, I think, widespread um, and politically palatable conversation, maybe, than it has been in previous years. That'd be great. Yeah, if I can just jump in there as well, it's a very good point. Um, and I think it's going to become increasingly important because we're seeing an increasing inequality, I think, in incomes from labor and income and capital. Um, and we know particularly high income earners have disproportionately high shares. Hello, <laughs> kitten. Um, the particularly higher shares of, of capital income, which do tend to be more lightly taxed um, acro across the board, particularly capital gains, but we also see it with dividend taxation, uh, interest taxation, and other forms of capital income as well. Um, and there I want to broaden out a little bit. We, we talked a lot about uh, some of the implicit biases in the tax system that reduce gender equality, but, but one thing that can actually improve gender equality in the tax system is the overall progressivity of the tax system, because we know that women tend to have lower incomes than men, and the more progressive the tax system, the more post-tax incomes are, uh, what's the word, <laughs> less unequal than, than pre-tax incomes. Uh, and it's an important thing to recognize that the tax system actually does have several implicit mechanisms to improve gender equality, primarily through the progressivity of the tax system. But that said, it's also important to look on a dynamic basis. And what we see in most OECD countries is that tax systems are getting less progressive. Um, the, the top statutory tax rate is declining in most countries, at least over the last 20 years or so. 
And then the other feature is that tax systems are moving away from reliance on personal income taxes for revenues and towards consumption taxes on revenues. And there are some good reasons for this, uh, but there can also be a gender impact if it makes the, the tax system more aggressive. And so one area I think that will be particularly important post COVID is thinking about how do we tax people on, on these very high incomes? Where does their, their income come from? Uh, and how can we improve the progressivity of the overall tax system, not just the labor tax system? Yeah. It's really fascinating. I think that maybe we'll just end there because um, that was just such a good wrap up of the concerns unless any of the panelists want to add something more. And I will add a little private interview on um, uh, with, with Atiya so she can make her points. And when we post the video on YouTube, we'll tack that on to this piece. But I just want to thank everybody. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate everybody spending the time. It's going to be so fascinating to see what un, un, goes on, you know, as we work on the recovering from COVID. Um, and again, just thank you all very much for participating. So bye. Bye. Okay, well, today I'm really thrilled to have Atia Weris from the University of Nairobi join us. And Atia does a lot of work on um, illicit financial flows and their impact on developing countries, but she's done a, a, some really interesting work on its, their impact on women and gender equality and also families. So Atia, do you want to just start off and talk about, you know, what are illicit financial flows and then how that ties into gender inequality as it goes through the tax system? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, Nina. So it's, I find illicit financial flows to be a very uh, interesting concept because it's not settled in law, as it were, and it's not agreed upon with the different countries in the world. So what I do like is the, the definition we have in, on the African continent. So we have an African Union high-level panel report that actually defined what illicit financial flows are from an African context. And, and I think many developing countries are in full agreement. And it's about movement, it's about the use of, and it's about the earning of money. Uh, and of course it's, it's transfer legally or illegally. As long as one part of the transaction is illegal, it falls under the definition of illicit. If um, there are issues that are not illegal, but borderline immoral, they also get considered. So I'll give you an example. If I'm poaching ivory and I'm giving ivory to another to an army uh, or a, you know or a militia group, and the militia group are actually giving me arms in exchange, so it's sort of small arms barter trade. In the African definition, this would include be included as illicit financial flows because even though it's barter and there's no shift of movement through a financial transaction, it would be included. On the other hand, it also allows us to include a single step outside the continent. So I do an activity here and I move the money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I think all of these definitions are very important because I think this particular set of definitions that we're seeing developing across the world have to be considered in the context of the kind of activity or economic activity that's taking place in a particular country. As far as gender is concerned, gender is always a really interesting dynamic. I, I didn't start out looking at gender. I'm, I consider myself a fiscal specialist and not a gender specialist, but I, I happened to do this piece of research and it was almost like an accident. And I started to see how women more and more are, are playing such a critical role in the whole area of illicit financial flows. So a, a simple example is uh, cross-border trade between say Kenya and Uganda. A lady will be manufacturing uh, cushions. She might be stitching them or making blankets and she will sell them to somebody in Uganda. Or in Uganda, a woman who's a farmer in her little garden will have extra bananas and they will get sold. Now, the way the transaction happens is it's the telephone system. 
uh, M-Pesa, online uh, transactions through our phone systems, allows for payments to grow, go from one phone to another, even within the same network, and even across networks. And of course, the goods would move by bus across the border and you wouldn't think twice about it. So illicit financial flows when it comes to gender has that element. But then there's also the enablers or the players. For, for a very long time, I think for almost 10, 10 plus years, when you would think of illicit financial flows, you would, um, with, with respect, it is what it is described as, uh, a bunch of white men juggling financial transactions somewhere. So even at a global level, people would think that this is gonna be something removed from our reality. But more and more, women are leading. Uh, tax uh, partners in global accounting firms tend to be women now. Tax directors in companies are women. So when you talk about the movement of finances, then of course women not only become players, but they can become enablers in a system that existed before women entered the workplace. And then this is where the whole gender dynamic really interested me because women have had this constant battle to enter into the workplace. It's only about 50 or 60 years old in the global north. And so now they're in it, but nobody went and rejigged the system to make room for, for women who are different or who think different. And of course, men also who think different. And so there isn't that inclusivity in the system. And, and so they either reject the system or they join it. So there are all of these different dimensions. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Now you wrote a paper that sort of um, in, in 2017 that really drove down like what is the impact on, you know, starting from the United Nations, you know, sustainable development goal for gender equality, um, you know, all of the various impacts of illicit financial flows. And I just thought, you know, it really shows that when you're in the tax world and you're just trying to, you know, you've got blinders on and, and you're just thinking about what the particular code provision is saying, people tend to forget about the purpose of taxation, you know, and then the consequence of that is, you know, if you're evading, to, if taxation has a purpose, if it's supposed to achieve certain policy goals and bring in revenue in order to meet certain policy goals, then the evasion or the the avoidance of it even can then have these downstream consequences. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, that paper and what prompted it and, and, and some of the observations you made, really the impact, the fiscal impact and the gender impact? I mean, so, I know that you were talking about its impact on delivery of social services and, and, you know, just the drying up of resources for countries. So illicit financial flows always have a twofold impact and also tax evasion and avoidance, which are part of it, have a twofold impact. The first is that you reduce the amount of revenue that the government has that is disposable income. So that's the tax collection, right? But the second thing that happens with illicit financial flows is that you're physically moving the money out of that uh, economy. So you lose twice. You lose the money that would actually circulate in the economy and then you lose the revenue that government could collect out of it. So even when we are looking at the impact of illicit financial flows, it has a double, sort of like a double whammy, you know, if you wanna, wanna uh, describe it that way. So when I started looking at illicit financial flows, I tried to understand how it breaks down at the grassroots level. And what I realized is that there are these constant debates of what we can do with our money. Can we have more kindergartens? Should we have more schools? Okay, we're in COVID right now. Do we have enough in emergency beds in our hospitals? Do we have enough hospitals? Oh my gosh, do we have enough medical workers? Like these are all funded through government funded uh, educational institutions. In Kenya, we have a, a really good scholarship scheme uh, in all the public universities. Uh, medical doctors are trained for pretty much free and on very low interest loans. Uh, of course, it's a fixed number, it's approximately two to 300. But when you come out at the end of the day, you wonder where they are, are they having an impact? Now, if we had more money, then we might have trained more staff. Like these are the direct correlations. Um, yeah, actually a couple of days ago, I was talking to one of the researchers at the University of Nairobi and he's actually been developing a vaccine uh, for COVID. And his biggest impediment is funding. But guess what? In this battle for vaccines, governments are funding their 
homegrown companies and they are domestic researchers. That is what they're doing. So when you have a developing country like Kenya, which has a very limited budget, and now you have this amazing professor who's trying to break through and find a cure, which is you know amazing, he, he doesn't get funding because the government doesn't have money because money did not enter the system when it should have. And I mean, these are the sort of things that have a direct impact. And Kenya and a couple of other countries, I mean, this is just for research. Kenya and a couple of other countries have a law that say that um, two to 3%, I think, of total government revenue should be allocated to research. And actually that is the first budget item cut when they run out of money. So this is the reality. This is, you know, I exported flowers, and I didn't pay my taxes. I landed the flowers in Amsterdam, but my company is registered in Dubai. Uh, and this is actually like a real life example, but I, I wouldn't name the company. Uh, and, and then in Dubai, I pay no taxes, but Dubai gets the benefit of the money circulating in the economy. Kenya, where the roses are produced, the only taxes that could be paid is that for any of the labor that's used and any VAT incurred? And if you're talking about agricultural products, then we have agreements with the Europe where there are waivers. Companies that are set up get uh, foreign direct investment waivers as well. So you're basically coming using a resource, depleting it, because of course the, the land also loses fertility. You're utilizing the staff probably as casual labor because that is the reality. The flower farm have uh, stuff that come in on a day-to-day -day wage basis. So they don't even pay income taxes necessarily. So there's literally nothing to support the system because of this sort of tax structure that's been created. And this is a really simple example. And then the end result is the, the flower auctions that are in Amsterdam. And there's been a huge pushback in, in Africa now. They want to move the cocoa auctions into West Africa, but I haven't heard anybody talk about the flower auctions. I mean, these are very important things that you make sure that the real price is registered in the real place. And that prevents illicit financial flows. So, you know, that actually raises the issue that if you really don't have that revenue coming in, then the governments ha in the developing countries have to look to some other source of revenue, which means either the development loans or it means the consumption taxes, which have their own impact, particularly on gender. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, what you've seen with, with that? So I think the one of the, the examples that always gives me goosebumps, but women don't like talking about it because sanitary pads and gender, you know, it's always the biggest flag bearer. Uh, but I will give you a slightly different example. Uh, so that's quite common. And that is of baby formula. Uh -huh. Many women across the world, including in Africa, are single mothers. Um, they have their children. They may or may not be able to breastfeed. As a result, they have to feed their babies formula. Formula is a product that is processed. And so you have, some, you have VAT on stages of process of goods. Now, if it's a single mother, as it very often is, then it is the woman who is bearing the burden of the tax, even though actually you can push it down to the child. And baby formula is actually seen as being a luxury good in many parts of uh, the developing world. So if you do not at minimum zero rate it or exempt it, the woman's tax burden is what goes up. It's a direct effect. The most common example does tend to be sanitary pads, but I think very often it is the baby formula that really hits home as well. Now, even within VAT, you have the option of an exemption or a zero rating. Right. And what I find very interesting is depending on how strong the political will is of a country, if they are not really pro a gender parity, they will zero rate it. If they are, they will exempt it. And I'll explain why. Once you exempt an item to get it back on the legislative list for taxing is, is close to like, it's really tough. But if you just zero rate it, then you're just zero rating it for that year. Next year, you can change your mind. Now, the connection that it then has to failures of governments to collect corporate income tax or even personal income tax from high net worth individuals is that that is always the trade-off. The moment you cannot get enough revenue, they don't change the benchmark or the target. They simply look for the softer 
place they can collect revenue from. Uh, a lot of African countries uh, put, uh, have, have tried to implement either solidarity taxes or solidarity funds that are predominantly voluntary, for example, during COVID. And for me, that is a beautiful uh, description of the level of trust societies are having in their states because people are not giving money voluntarily. Right. And you have to ask yourself why. But then I will take you to a very different space. Uh, I finished a book, uh, it was published uh, in 2019, November. It's called Financing Africa. I spent about 15 years mapping out data across the African continent. Uh, South Africa is one of the few countries that actually has gender disaggregated data. And, and I know in a recent conversation that even the US is starting to look at it, which is it's a really interesting, <laughs> yeah, there's an interesting reflection point of where countries are. Uh, but when I looked at the data, I saw that a country like Senegal only has 1% of its population over the age of 18 registered to pay income tax. So 1%, right? 1% of the people over 18. Then you come across to the other side, which is Kenya, and we're about 30 to 40% registered, but on average, only about 25% actually submit returns. Then you go further down south and South Africa is at 99%, which frankly, I'm not convinced about. So I'm really worried about that data because <laughs> informal economy is huge. Yeah. And so the reality we cannot move away from is it, it really can't be possible. So it's really interesting when you look at the statistics, you can't tell who's paying. In all these examples I've given you, most of these countries don't even separate corporations from individuals, let alone gender disaggregated data. And it's certainly not publicly available. So we can't even question and ask if we can't get access. Yeah, so it's, it's a messy space. Yeah. And I'm just praying and hoping that people will get better at it so that, so that we can find some clarity and make better decisions. Yeah, it'll yeah. be really interesting to see what what they can come up with in terms of you know the united states now you know at least because people put their social security number in the united states on their returns and social security knows that at least the gender at birth of the person in their records you could cross it now both the irs guards so carefully its data it has its privacy rules and social security has its privacy rules so to get you know to get that data to cross requires someone up above them, namely, you know, the administration to say, we're going to do this. And that's, that's what's going to be very interesting. This is the really the first time that you're having that kind of, there are, there are research studies with, with aggregate data, but to get into like, well, the income, all of the details of that, you really have to have a very detailed study. And there is no, they're not, taking data by race on the tax return. So, you, and you don't have, I, one thing that will be interesting, this is the first year in the United States that on the tax return, there'll be a mark that people can say, I want to receive my communications in a different language. And this will be a very important data point going forward, which will give us some sense, you know, of the people who are uncomfortable in the United States who are taxpayers, but are uncomfortable speaking in English about taxes that they need to have. They want their, their, their notices and things coming to them in a different language. So that will be going forward, a really interesting source of data in a country as large as ours with as many languages as we have present in the United States. Yeah, I don't know whether the IRS, they do have a contract where if you call up and you say, I need to speak in another language, they do have an interpreter contract where some, a third person will be on the line. It takes a while to set it up, but it has been there for years. But you know, if you get a notice that's not in your language and by the time that you found somebody to translate it, you know, whatever the notice is threatening has already happened. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, and I found this fascinating. So 80% of most African countries are informal economies. And we have so many people living in informal housing and in slum areas or out in the villages where there aren't even roads going out there. And then you think to yourself, well, how are you going to get tax uh, 
tax communication to them or illicit financial flow communication. But it's not even about getting communication to them. How do you even support them? How do you grow them and build them and help them grow and build and you know reduce poverty? And of course, I, I love this example. Um, it, it used to be controversial in my country, but now it's it's a it's an example we really uh, like to embrace. The definition of the common man in Kenya is actually a common woman. Her name is Wanjiku. So we even have a name for her, which is awesome. And she is a lady of approximately 19 or 20 years old. She already has three or four children. She has possibly finished high school, most likely. She has a small self subsistence garden. And so she's single. And so her money that's extra from her little garden is what she then uses to pay for school fees or books or clothes for her children. And you know, that definition is still very alive in most parts of the continent. In fact, in most parts of, of the continent, that may actually be someone middle class. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine the reality on the ground of what we are facing? We, we really need to rethink what we do with the finances in our country how we utilize it, how we protect it. And I think protection is critical, but also open accountability. I think we have to stop being afraid to show when things are clean and when they are not so clean, we have to be able to show it and then actually deal with it and, and expedite the matter. But I think um, one of the weaknesses of women on the continent is that we may have literacy, but it, as far as financial or fiscal literacy is concerned, we're behind the curve. Mm. So. There are fewer women who understand the mathematics of taxation and tax systems. And very often that is, that is where the weakness lies. Uh, there have been studies in the slum areas that actually they helped women calculate how much it would cost for them to stay in the slum or move into low income housing. And they didn't even realize it was cheaper to live in the low income housing than it was to live in the slum. So those sort of projects are ongoing. In, uh, in Rwanda, I remember there was a discussion with women who were smuggling textiles into Rwanda and the revenue authorities just sat with them and did the mathematics of it. How much do you pay to smuggle? Okay, why didn't you come pay your taxes? And then you're not stressed, you know, you're relaxed. I mean, these are, and they all, they all have taxpayer numbers now. I thought it was brilliant. But that's the reality. Really brilliant just to sit down and go through those steps and not as a gotcha, you know, but, you know, like now we're going to show that you owe all this money at the end. It's like, no, let us talk about going forward and let's show you why what you're doing now is actually costing you more than if you came into part of the economy. Yes. Yes. I mean, people think I'm a bit radical, but I actually said to people, explain the system give a blanket backwards amnesty only for people who are not on the system, right? Right, And pay particular attention, especially to women because they are over 55% of the country right now. And then tell them, okay, now you've got to do your thing. Instead, what we do have, and for me, this is part of illicit financial flows, you have tax amnesties being given for people who took money out of the country and brought it back in right. or invested without declaring. You know, we're busy giving benefits to those who are actually abusing deliberately and then not looking uh, to the future and the generation coming up, but also at the mothers who are now trying to struggle and the number of single mothers is huge. So these mothers will then explain to their children that, oh my God, this is how my life used to be. And then I sorted out my taxes and now I go to the clinic and demand service. That's what I want to hear. Right, that is that's uh, such a fascinating, that's just to me, such a wise use of the tax administrative authority. And, and it's, it's, as you say, it's really looking at how you increase voluntary compliance going forward and you connect it to what we started the conversation with is that the reason for taxes is to provide public goods. And so if you're underground, then you feel like you can't demand those goods because that surfaces you. And once you surface bad things, in the system will happen to you. But now you can go and demand things of the system. You are a taxpayer. It's it's yes. just, it's, and you've got to get over that initial hump. Yeah, yes. Amazing. And I think that is so important. Just asking, being able to have the energy and the to feel empowered enough to ask. Yeah. So yeah, 
Yeah, but COVID has thrown a lot of things up to light, uh, especially for women. Um, immediately during when the curfew was being implemented. So in Kenya, there's been a curfew and we actually closed the borders of the city, of the city limits um, for almost, I think, five or six months uh, at a certain point. And one of the problems we soon noticed was that there was so much emphasis on COVID that women who were pregnant or sick couldn't actually get to hospital. So we had women, because the emergency wasn't working, the ambulance was focusing on COVID. You know, we, we completely shifted attention without taking into consideration the ongoing health needs. And I think that that is where people should have the voice. And I think participation is so important. Uh, they should have the voice to say, hey, but yes, but I'm still pregnant. So how do I deal with this, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, what are you going to do in two months when my baby's due? And what if my baby comes earlier and it's curfew time? I mean, these were simple explanations that needed help that, you know, nobody really gave it. And I think it, it COVID's reaction in many African countries was it became like a, a middle class and upper class response. It was the people who had traveled who are middle and upper class, you know, and oh my God, we are so scared. So we are protecting ourselves. And we forgot about the lived realities of people in the lower classes. Yeah. And, and I think that was really bad. So, yeah. Talk, talking about that, you mentioned when we were discussing this a little bit earlier, you were talking about, you know, what the impact of COVID on the digital, I mean, on the, on the informal economy that, that it was also bringing people who lost jobs that had formal jobs and women in particular, then moved into the informal economy, but it was a digital aspect of the informal economy. So I found this fascinating. So, you know, we, we shut down city limits and we shut down restaurants and pubs. And then we shut down businesses like that came pretty fast work remotely all the rest all of a sudden if you were not in an organization that was savvy enough or your business basically collapsed which a lot of them did globally uh, we were also talking about that then you were jobless so you went from being a formal member of, uh, of the empl uh, formally employed so you remember the formal sector and now you're going home so this was happening to both men and women so those who could leave the city limits moved quickly but we were all stuck in the city because they had shut the city limits so you would be jobless sitting in nairobi very expensive don't know what to do we saw um, incredible mushrooming of uh, informal businesses but how do they advertise? And this was fascinating. They would advertise on um, Facebook and Instagram. That is where they do it. If you are able to, you could register your products on Kili Mall or Jumia, but that is quite difficult to do. And especially since people's systems were not yet up and running, but they were setting up Facebook accounts and Instagram accounts and running their businesses through it. And there are so many now, it has mushroomed. So the first was the people who were formerly employed who now entered into that space. But what was fascinating was those who were already in the informal sector because digitization was so widespread, their systems were made easier. So they already were using Facebook and Instagram. Um, they were already using M-Pesa for their transactions. And that just blew up. Like they were now cooking 24 hours a day or stitching clothes, you know, doing tailoring. A lot of the more women-led businesses seem to have really grown. And because uh, there was also a shutdown of the border, so you couldn't really import stuff if you wanted things that before used to import, now you had to buy it locally. So you had to go look for it. And that became the place. And the digital systems also really helped them because they could make M-Pesa transactions. So we still have goods that move across some of the borders. With Kenya and Tanzania, it's a little bit difficult, but it still works over Kenya, Uganda. Uh, and so you could send goods across in either way, move them around the country some ways and uh, get paid. And I, I think I was joking with someone the other day and saying that every single person in Nairobi has their favorite um, motorbike rider. We all have numbers of a motorbike rider. So if we've bought something, they will be, okay, John is on his way to you because that is who's bringing us our stuff. And so there's this whole economy that has developed almost, um, as, as a parallel, and it's actually growing. So I actually think informal sector could be 90% now, if not 95% of the economy. Wow, that's amazing.
And so if it's on, if it's, are they registered for that or anything like that? No, no I didn't think no. so. <laughs> <laughs> and the tax auditors were not going to go check on you because they were worried about COVID as well. So there was no audits taking place. There were no visits and uh, city council were not going to come look for you because you wouldn't even let them in your house. You'd be like, oh my God, you could be bringing COVID to me. So no, I'm not going to let you in. So people were actually growing quite safely in that period. You know, that's yeah. so interesting. So that sort of leads you to think now what happens in that transition after COVID when you've left a digital footprint because it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, you know, so you can see that there's once people are beginning to come back to some kind of processes, like the tax agency is beginning to start looking at things. How will they transit? This goes, this presents a really interesting problem. Like how do you transition these people then into the system? Um, I can teach you how to tax evade with that question, <laughs> which is throw away your SIM card and get a new one. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Stop, delete your Instagram account. I mean, it's it's. I mean, there are ways around it. I think that um, the Revenue Authority, at least in Kenya, does seem aware of it because they have hired recently a whole batch of young techies. And I think they're going to be looking at websites. So if Kenyans are not aware of that, well, you know, here's my warning for you. Um, and I think many African countries will start looking at that. But we have to still remember that internet before COVID was about 30% internet penetration on the continent. Maybe now because of COVID, it, it has risen to 40, 45 maybe even 50%, I, but I doubt it. Um, which means that even though we are talking about digital economy, th that is, I think, so important. This is not low income we're talking about. We're talking about middle income informal right. sector right. and high income informal sector, because right. you can also get bespoke stationery. You can get um, bespoke flower arrangements and really fancy, you know, homemade chocolate sort of things going on. So it's not that you're getting a low end um, product, you're getting a really high end product. But I do think the one way that low income uh, earners have managed to use the digital system is that the USSD codes are still very active. And those are really useful because that doesn't necessarily require Wi-Fi access. That is part of it. Now, there is another gender element um, that I've started to notice since COVID, uh, we actually had a study on increase in teenage pregnancies ever mm -hmm. since uh, people went home. And those are the things you hear when they come back. My female students are not coming back to school as much, not because they don't want to, but because they cannot. That's one part of it. The other part of it is they are now drawn into the normal household work, which is very engaging. So again, couldn't study online will not develop, might actually miss schooling. So, you know, at each category of um, each age group, there is a different set of issues. Each financial status, you can actually pick out different um, priority issues. So, yeah, it doesn't make it easier. The transition is going to be difficult. And I think the simplest thing is what you said. It's the national social security number, which we are doing. Uh, we have this thing called a Huduma number that we're waiting for it to be rolled out. And that is probably the best thing ever if you can have one number that just follows you throughout your life and it can just pick it up. But the other thing that I think is so critical is that government needs to stop being aggressive. And when I say aggressive, it means that we need better customer care from the police. We need better customer care from revenue. We need better customer care from hospitals and schools. And if you don't improve the customer care, you're going to lose the next generation because this new generation now doesn't care about formal formality anymore. We, right. We've lost so many of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that, that it's, I've worked on so many projects trying to convince people of the value of what you call customer care. And, you know, they always want to do a cost benefit analysis. And it's, and you can always show for the enforcement dollar that you spend, whether it's police or tax or whatever, you know, a dollar amount that that brings in. But it's so difficult to show, you know, the dollar amount that taking care of people and providing service brings in. And yet, you know, if you don't have that, then trust erodes, informal grows, at, you know, 
efforts to avoid, evade, hide, grow, you know, self-help grows in the sense of you've treated me so badly, I'm going to get back at you, you know, loss yes. repair, you know, I'm going to figure out ways that you'll never be able to find. And, and, you know, that's difficult to measure. We've tried to do some tests, but it's just so core to me. And that goes back to that, or that example that you gave of people sitting down and actually just doing the math for folks and showing smuggling versus being part of the system. And it's not just that immediate transaction, it's what you get as a result of being part of the system, what you can demand once you're part of the system. And that's just so, it's like, Sometimes people get it and then other times you're talking to them and they just think, yes, but if we put another auditor out on the street, you know, we'll bring in this much money. Yeah, but if you'd sat down with people, you might have gotten much more. So, yes. so, to, to, you, so you triggered up two things in my mind. One is that recently the president of Kenya released a statement saying that government is losing two billion a day in corruption. And then we did the simple maths of it. And the simple maths of it based on our tax collection um, annually means that over 50% of our tax collection is lost. So now a message like that to the normal taxpayer who's actually compliant is I will now not pay you and I will avoid it to the maximum. To the ones not on the tax net, they're going to say, I am never going to get a TIN number. They're just going to take 50% of whatever I give anyway. So I'm going to get 50% of the services. So, you know, these are the direct mathematics that are going on in people's heads. So that, that's the first thing that you've triggered. The, the other thing that you triggered off is actually, I just read a policy brief. I will, I will share it with you. I think you'd like to put it up. Um, a professor down in South Africa did a study of 2,800 academics, I believe women, to find out if their workplace had changed during the pandemic. And the one thing that really popped up was also unpaid care work. And we haven't talked about unpaid care work uh, because there isn't a big drive for it on the continent. But during COVID, a lot of young people have been forced to do unpaid care work because family don't see what they're doing at home, right? So it's how are we keeping the young people engaged? So all of these become problems across the board, everywhere you look. And I think if we don't use the money properly, and I think sometimes it's chicken and egg, you need to show how the services work so that I still remain a willing taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And if I'm middle and upper class, I will probably opt for a private healthcare provider or educational establishment. But at the end of the day, 90% of your population needs it. So, you know, encouraging that um, patriotic approach where yes, your taxpayer money is being used for others, but you get a peace of mind knowing it's actually being utilized, right? So that's one part of it. But the other part of it is I would love the country. And I think we have a real potential in, in Kenya. Sometimes I say we are the cusp of greatness. We, we have the ability to pay for our services. We are now reaching a stage in the growth of our economy and in the growth of our uh, tax collection and revenue building. I mean, where infrastructure projects are off the charts here right now. I think it's going to really jump the economy up. We have the ability to become an independent country, not taking debts and loans. And you need to put that into the mind of people, especially the younger generation who, like all of us, didn't grow up in a system where tax was normal. You need to inculcate that in it. You need to absorb it so that people think about it. So it is, yes, about taxpayers' rights, but it's also about taxpayers' responsibilities. Yeah. You know, it's both sides. And, and bringing that together, I think, is usually quite good. Yeah. Well, that's... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, this has just been absolutely fascinating. And... Um, I'm going to leave you with the last word, you know, but I just want to thank you for taking the time out to chat with us today, because I think we've touched on so many really important issues. And I think it's, you know, the viewers are just going to, their little brains are going to explode, but that's okay. <laughs> there is a, there is a wonderful Liberian proverb. Whenever I'm trying to unpack the human rights, the illicit financial flows, and the tax, and the gender. I, I love to use it. And, and they say that you don't measure the timber to build a house in the forest. And, and I love it because, you know, you have to take the chunk off. Then you have to bring it out of the forest. 
then you measure it to fit the size of the house you want to build. And I think all of these elements within um, fiscal systems that we've talked about, all of these are like those, those trees in the forest that we're now trying to, so we need to see the tree for the forest, you know, it's, it's that sort of thinking. Mm -hmm. We need to see each tree and then pull it out and then understand it and see where it fits and make sure it fits right. And it, it's a long-term process, it's not short, but I think it's, it's worth it if we want to make sure that everyone grows together and, and we are inclusive. So yes, I'll stop there. Thank you, Nina. Atia, thank you. Thank you so much. Hold on, stop.